Hey folks, I'm Lance Eaton, and this video is an introduction to hybrid flexible teaching and learning. Uh, we won't go over everything that there is to say here, but we will delve into a little bit about how I got into it, some of the big things to consider, its benefits, its challenges, uh, and some resources that you can look at and use to help you think about how you might approach hybrid flexible teaching and learning. All right, let's get started. So I actually want to talk about how I came to this. Uh, so this was back in 2013. I was teaching and I had been teaching a course that started that that went once a week. So it was one of those three hour courses at the end of the day and I would have students who might miss a week and they'd come back to me and say two weeks later my life fell apart. I want to try to stay in this class. What do I need to do? And I was feeling really horrible about this idea of like their life's falling apart. And I'm like, well, you're now two weeks behind. Uh, that didn't feel good. I didn't like it. And it made me think about, well, what are ways that we could actually help that student if they missed the class to be able to keep moving along? And so I started to think about a course in which what would happen if there was a way that you could take the course entirely face to face you could take the course entirely online or you could move back and forth as as you see fit as met your needs as a student who is living in a world and especially nowadays feels increasingly chaotic challenging and hard for everybody not just our most mar not just our marginalized students so I started to actually design a course and it was a, a uh, American literature course and I started to run it and I actually got to run it in the spring semester of 2015 which if you lived in New England you might recall is when we had uh, we had a series of blizzards every Monday through Wednesday for about five weeks basically the campus the semester started in uh, late January and I saw my students that first Wednesday and then I we did not actually have formal class until the end of February but because I had this structured as the course we actually didn't miss a beat because the unstable weather meant we we had to go online and we were able to continue our learning students were able to continue engaging in the class and then those who wanted to come back to the face-to-face -face class could come back in late February after the storms. And so that's one of the biggest benefits for me around hybrid flexible course design is it allows for us to navigate some of these challenges. And if people are able to, to check in, they can. And if people can't, well, the, the materials will still be there for them when they are. So when I talk about hybrid flexible course design, my definition is a course that's designed to empower students to determine where and how they learn best. Hybrid means mixing face to face with both synchronous and asynchronous online learning. Flexible means students choose their conditions online versus face to face, which may impact their learning materials, activities and assessment. So this is not without its challenges. Uh, it is not necessarily easy. But I don't know that it's uh, like it's not easy because it's not easy or because it's unfamiliar to us and it's just going to take time for us to learn how to do this. The reality is every format, every way that we have engaged in teaching and learning uh, takes us a while to adapt to, takes us a while to learn and figure out what the proper uh, practices are. So let's look at some of these challenges. So the first is, you know, on the instructor on the instructor's behalf, really needing to develop a clear vision, really giving some forethought into this. Uh, for most of us, if we're teaching courses, if it's past our first or second time that we've taught the course, we don't always set a very clear intention, a very clear vision to how we're going to teach and what it means to be teaching. And so that's something that that I think is can be challenging and creates you know new concerns for faculty especially if you've been doing something for a long while the change can feel uncomfortable it can feel challenging the next is that it takes time to build and that you do have to give a you have to give more forethought 
to how you're going to make it work across these different environments and also some recognition with that that we're, you're going to build you're going to kind of plan and that at the same time things are going to change uh you may find that you have to pivot in the midst of class or pivot uh if you're seeing certain trends occur that feel like you're not you or the students aren't where um any of them want to be then you know both recognizing you need to build and that some of those things you may not end up needing but building them and being prepared is going to help you feel more comfortable with the changing or the moving as needs as needs be explaining without overwhelming and this is sometimes really challenging because this hybrid flexible course design is more complex than what we are used to and so trying to find that right balance trying to both feed the information you know feed uh information ideas and approaches without necessarily you know sending them with uh, sending them into overload and so the next piece is getting everybody on the same rung uh, and what i mean by this is if you are working across these different platforms in a given class or as you move week to week trying to make sure people are in that same space uh, and so th that is a that is a realistic challenge and yet it is not something to that that is that different than when we are in face-to-face -face or when we're on online classes. Uh, right here at the bottom, I have a link to a set of materials within that Google folder. You will find all sorts of examples of assignments and activities. There's a subfolder that is specifically on hybrid flexible um, support materials that we'll also talk about later. But just know that that's a really good place to go and get resources. So that that link is uh, https colon forward slash forward slash bit bit dot ly forward slash capital L capital E dash capital S L I D E capital D E C K S. All right, but let's talk about some of the benefits. So one of the things I really appreciate about hybrid flexible learning is it offers students choice and opportunity for self-direction. Our students live in a world that for many of us is very, very different from the world we grew up in. The challenges that they face from employment to stress to having to learn during pandemics uh, and many other very challenging experiences gives them a little more control in figuring out you know, what they need to do, how they need to do it, and what feels right for them. Uh, it gives them a chance to dabble in online learning before taking an entire online course. It gives them a chance to think about what are their difference of experiences in a face-to-face -face, physically and a face-to-face -face or a, a synchronous online course. So it really gives that richness for them for choice, opportunity. Uh, it helps them in navigating their other life obstacles, right? So uh, at the moment while I'm recording this, gas prices are skyrocketing. And that means some of our students, it's, it literally costs more to show up every day. And yes, people can say, well, it's just a little bit here or there, but that's on top of also the inflation that we've been facing. And these are things that hit our, our students who are most who are most marginalized the most. So the idea that we can give them a little more choice, allow them to navigate their complex lives a little bit more, I think is really important. Um, and what I've found is it actually creates more opportunities for creativity and one-to-one -one connection. Uh, and I find that's also enriching the w different ways that you end up being able to use space and use time now that you're using it a little more flexible. It removes artificial barriers around um, the construct of the class or what classes feel like. You know, that three hour class that I talked about earlier, I mean, in some ways that that is obnoxious. And to, I will say as, as somebody who's been both instructor and student in those classes, like making anybody sit in those seats for three hours, is, um, that feels wrong. It makes people uncomfortable in a way that they shouldn't be uncomfortable. And so it's that artificial barrier of comfortability uh, or around that, that uncomfortability. Uh, it opens up new ways of structuring class time and also uh, resituate what it means to teach and learn. That last one I think is something I've really enjoyed is just how it allows me to change up things and give students a little more, uh, get, allow students to express more agency and willingness to take the class in directions um, because of how it's been structured. So in order to do this, 
we have to think about what are the skills, the tools, and the terrain that we're working in. Now, when I say the skills, what I'm talking about is what do you bring as an instructor with your professional experience, with your teaching experience, with your teaching philosophy? What does it mean for you to show up in this space and think about what teaching and learning looks like across these spaces? What do your students bring? This is something I don't think we always consider. And I think it, it, for us, it, it leaves uh, or it closes opportunities for thinking about what do my students bring into the space that we can use and leverage for teaching and learning, for expanding our understanding about whatever the topic is, and for leveraging our students' abilities and what they can help us do. And then what does your institutional supports and staff bring? Uh, every institution has different types of supports that can be really helpful, whether that's your instructional design team, your library staff, your accessibilities team, these are your teaching and learning center. These are all folks that can help you brainstorm and figure out how to do this well or how to draw upon other research, other ways that things work, or to help you understand what your strengths are. Now there's also the tools, there's the classroom tools. That's both the physical classroom where they're talking about projectors and whiteboards and, and the like, there's the institutional tools. So, what are the uh, what are the tools that are within the school that you have lever you have access to, and that might include things like recording. Uh, video recording tool or classroom recording tools. It, it's your learning management system. A lot of those different things that you can leverage to help you think about and build support materials around this. And then there's the students tools. And we sometimes, you know, we sometimes look at this through a deficit lens and say, oh, well, they don't have certain things. And yet at the same time, not all of them will, but some of them do. And so thinking about what are the tools and with the tools and skills that they bring that they can do that can enhance and build and really maximize the learning that takes place in a course across these different uh, modalities. And then there's the actual terrain, the physical classroom, the learning management system, and the video conferencing tool. And just being aware of what are the benefits and the drawbacks of each, because obviously they all have them. People want to think the classroom is this wonderful place, but it's also a really challenging place. Uh, I mentioned the uncomfortable chairs. Also for myself, who I have dyslexia and it manifests in sound, which means hearing can be a challenge, which means if I'm in small groups in a classroom, it's going to be harder for me to concentrate than if I'm in breakout rooms in a video conferencing space. So thinking about what are the benefits and the drawbacks, what are the ways that each of these spaces are or aren't accessible, and how you, how you might mix and match or at least think about that and help figuring out how you map out your course. And then there's the guide. I mentioned before that there's the link at the bottom of this slide uh, and many of the other slides. Within that is a uh, Google folder that has three what I would call worksheets that are really there for you to help figure things out and help to think about your own teaching practice. The first is restructuring and resituation, resituating class time. That is thinking about how you use these different things, uh, how you use different strategies to think about um, what it means for you to be face to face, for students to be in different environments. The teaching inventory is a really great opportunity for you to sit down and think about what are all the skills, abilities, and tools that you can call upon. We sometimes under under-realize this. Uh, I, I, I talk to many faculty who will say things like, oh, you know, I'm not really good at technology. And then we start talking about all the things that they can do. And we're sometimes too focused on the things that we can't do that when we start listing all the things we can do, it's a pretty surprising list. And then finally, and this is the, probably the most important document, it's the hybrid flexible course map activity. And what this does is try to help you walk through each week, what does it look like? What does it look like in your face-to-face? -face? What does it look like for your virtual students? What does it look like for your students who are a, a, attending uh, just asynchronously online and kind of think about what you will be doing and how different students will be, uh, be proceeding through the class. So along those lines, as you're starting to think about and build out this course, one of the things I strongly recommend is borrowing. Uh, 
we are teachers, we are sharers by nature. There is a lot of materials out there uh, around learning materials as well as activity guides that you can use to build upon. Uh, you will find these obviously in your institute, uh, whether that's within your department, within the library, within your community of faculty as a whole. You will find professional resources, so you might look at things like disciplinary repositories, uh, schol uh, scholarship of teaching and learning resources, government materials. There's a slew of professional materials out there that you can use to help come up with, support, supplement uh, what you're doing in these different spaces. And then there's lots of materials beyond that. There's open educational resources, which there are millions of great re things out there. There's things that are in the public domain, and then there's always things that you can link to or simply read and borrow and adapt. Along those lines, as you're starting to think about creating, you know, what your hybrid flexible course is looking like, you can also think about what are the things that you can use to help you create. So here again, you can kind of think about the individual creations could be things like guidelines, learning guides, videos, audio recordings. But you can also think about crowdsourcing creations. In here, you might look at colleagues or departments or disciplines where you can work together and build things that you both can use. And so while instead of you building five things, you build two, a colleague builds two, and another colleague builds two, and you share it together and therefore have more ability to use those things across those different courses. These can be a variety of things of how to create, you know, these can be things that are both how to run the class as well as things that are related to the types of class you are teaching. And then there's also student created, and this is something I really enjoy and I do a lot of, which is have students create content both for the current course and for future courses. This can come in the, the this comes around in, in doing things like wikis, annotated or enhancing course text, uh, explainers such as text, video, or audio that break down concepts that you're exploring in the class. Uh, and it comes across really cool to be able to have students teach other students uh, because there's a lot of power in the student getting to teach and how much they learn and then the students being able to learn from one another. Okay. So those are just some, some strategies, some practices, and things like this. What I want to hit here are what have been my key findings in exploring, figuring out, and thinking about hybrid flexible teaching. So the first are the practical points. Uh, the first is that there is no perfect solution. Uh, there will, and I say this, and I'm okay with this, and I would say the classroom itself is not a perfect solution. I have not found it to be. I know many others haven't either. So there's no perfect way to think about or to get everybody or anything like that um, in the hybrid flexible space. But the reality is that's a true across the board. And it's not about a perfect solution. It's about continually iterating and figuring out what does work, listening to students, helping and building towards more effective means of learning in these spaces. Being selective at the activity buffet. Uh, I use this as a, as a shorthand for there is so much you can do. Um, there's so many different ways you can make this work. And you do not want to overfill your plate. You don't want to overfill your plate in a given semester because you're going to get tired. Your students are going to get tired. And so what I always recommend is trying to figure out like what are one, two, or maybe three things you can test, you can try, you can use in a given semester. And this might include the different technologies and you know the different types of assignments and you know, see what works, learn from it update those and then try something new the next semester to add on to that but don't try to do everything at once the other thing to remember is the locus of power is where the instructor is and this is something to just think about what that means for how you engage with students in the different spaces so if you show up and are in the physical classroom that's where the locus of power is. So what does that mean for your practice? What does that mean for how you engage with students who are attending virtually or synchronous online? And what does that mean for your asynchronous students? And be thinking about and navigating that in or, or reflecting on what that means throughout your practice. And does do you catch yourself? And I think this is an important thing. Do you catch yourself having judgments 
about students who are not there physically. And if you do, what do you do with that? Because I, I think we sometimes are giving the primacy of physical space at the cost of those who cannot be there physically. And then the final is, we're all still living through a three-year pandemic. Yes, we have vaccines. Yes, we've been able to get through the latest wave, but we're still feeling the effects of that. We're still feeling it in many, many different ways, and we'll still be experiencing different aspects of that for years to come. And so that that really does necessitate a pedagogy of care for ourselves and for our students and to be mindful of that. And to be mindful that even if you may be through it, not everybody is, uh, you know, given where people are able, not able, comfortable, not comfortable with getting vaccines or feeling like they have to be extra precautious because they live, you know, so much of this has brought up an, a stronger awareness of people who already have vulnerable immune systems. So just being mindful of that, just taking that into consideration. And then the pedagogical points, um, and I, sometimes I would say more slightly uh, controversial points. In one of the things that that gets faculty sometimes tripped up is when they think about this environment, they're thinking about equality of experience, and what you're really looking for is equity of experience. Are you creating spaces and opportunities for students to learn? And they don't necessarily look the same but they achieve the same outcomes. And that I think is one of the bigger challenges is to be thinking about, you know, even if I'm having students do an activity in the live course, I don't necessarily need my students in the, uh, in the asynchronous course to be doing the same activity. I do necessarily need them to be achieving similar outcomes, but I don't necessarily need them to be doing the exact same activity. And so this is where lateral thinking comes into play. Thinking about how you can pivot, thinking about what are good analogies or comparisons or things that line up, even if they're not the exact same thing. So for instance, they may be having a lively discussion in the face-to-face -face course, but you might have them doing a blog post in the asynchronous, if they're, they're not attending face-to-face -face and they are there asynchronously, asynchronously that week. That is parallel. They are, you know, they are engaging with their ideas, they are sharing their ideas, they're putting them together in, in a meaningful way. The other thing to really be thinking about is agency and community. Um, spend time creating community, both virtually, you know, bo both in the, the people that are attending synchronously and the asynchronous space. I can't stress that enough. That is super important to build those bonds. You need, like, learning is relational and we can say it's not and we can just you know blast through and, and focus on the the teaching um, or the the cramming of information but if you want to really make that space work you need community and within that you need agency you need to be able to uh, you need students to feel like they have choice like they have that they have power that they are able to control and not be controlled students have been subjected to control in numerous ways throughout the pandemic and prior i think we only do more harm by making them feel like they have to draw, jump through a lot of artificial hoops just to make us happy and the last is trust the room. And that is really developing a trusting relationship with your students, working to help understand, listen, hear, pay attention to who they are and what they need in responding to that and not getting lost in, uh, in ego, which when we teach there, there, there's often a, there's often our ego that, that is there front and center, whether we realize it or not. We, uh, we have decided we have the ability to stand up in, a in front of a bunch of people and teach them, to tell them you know, how to understand a very complex subject. That requires some ego, and, we, and we, we've earned that ego in some ways, but we also have to be mindful of that and not let it, not let it um, override the ways that we engage and think about and trust our students.
Okay, that's all I have. I hope this is useful. Uh, if you have questions, I look forward to them. If there's other things, uh, feel free to reach out. And of course, please take advantage of those, re uh, those materials. They are uh, covered under a Creative Commons license. Thank you so much.